The Muscarelli logo is so good. Who, did, who designed that, David? We had a firm uh, in that did a big study about 10 years ago on just how we might rebrand. And this was mm -hmm. one of, I think this was in the first round of about five options that they gave us. It's really good. Mm -hmm. It is. It's really good. For those of you who have, who have already gathered, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes here. Well, good evening. My name is David Brashear. I'd like to welcome you to our second lecture of this fall season. We have a number of programs set up for the season. Hope you'll join us for many of them. I wanted to just give you an introduction to our next two lectures that we'll be bringing to you once again via Zoom on October 16th as part of our homecoming celebration We'll be hosting for a 2 p.m. lecture, our great, great friend and outstanding speaker, Elaine Ruffalo, an art historian who will be joining us from Florence. The Muscarelli and Elaine have a long relationship. She's been the leader of several board of directors trips to Italy. Uh, I think we visited Florence, Rome, and Venice on three different trips with Elaine. She's an outstanding speaker very knowledgeable across the, the entire body of uh, art history with a particular emphasis on Italy. She's going to be talking to us about portraiture under the title From Antiquity to the Selfie, Portraiture Through the Ages. And then on October 22nd, I'll be with you 
bringing forward a presentation that was originally scheduled for our spring season this past spring of selected topics in architecture. And I'll be speaking about the Chicago Tribune Tower architectural competition of 1922, really a seminal event in the evolution of tall buildings and skyscrapers, not only in the United States, but around the world. We have a number of other programs this fall. You can view our complete programming at muscarelli.org, our website, and it's easy to register for different events through that site. Well, tonight, of course, our topic is recent research on campus, water, water everywhere, circa 1710. And I think we're doing this in the spirit of defining the term museum a bit more broadly at William & Mary than we've defined it in the past. Uh, Susan Kern has been executive director of William & Mary's historic campus since 2014. She's joining us tonight for this talk. She has a PhD in early American history from the College of William and Mary and a master's degree in architectural history from the University of Virginia. Between her degrees, she worked as an archeologist at Monticello, including two years as director of that department. And her research at Monticello became the basis for her award-winning book, her first book, The Jeffersons at Shadwell, published by Yale in 2010. Susan's a colleague of mine, a good friend, and we welcome her for her talk tonight. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, David. Welcome. Give us a moment while we change Zooms here. Uh, good evening. I'm opening tonight with William and Mary's land acknowledgement statement, uh, and I will, uh, for the for the time it takes uh, to read through this, just a, a moment of silence to acknowledge it. Susan, we don't have it up yet, or I don't. Oh, okay. Tell me when that appears to you. Is that not appearing? Let me try this again. There it goes. There we go, sorry about that. Okay, uh, William & Mary's land acknowledgement statement. And with that, we enter into some of the earliest history of the development of the campus we call William and Mary. Um, here we go. <clears throat> so, uh, water, water everywhere, uh, circa 1710, or what I did uh, during the summer of 2019. So uh, I was introduced to my summer 19 plans abruptly uh, when uh, the skid steer that belongs to the paving contractors that were relaying the brick walks on historic campus uh, changed my summer plans. Um, the contractor, uh, Scott Smith, uh, who is a wonderful person to work with because he is truly a partner in preserving William and Mary's campus uh, in his work, making it a, a better place for all of us, uh, uh, st turned off this, his skid steer uh, when one of his ground crew said, uh, there's something under here you need to stop. So Scott came into the Wren building and got me, uh, and I came out to find this, uh, you know, so um, <laughs> this is a, a stop what you're doing and respond kind of moment. Um, and I looked underneath that slab. Wow. Um, you know, this is, this is really exciting stuff. Um, so uh, this is what I could see, uh, you know, kind of through this uh, shadowy uh, opening. Uh, and here's this, what appears to be uh, a vaulted space down here, a, a curved opening uh, with an English bond uh, structured box uh, around it. Uh, and um, immediately I thought, well, you know, maybe this is one of the college drains uh, that I know a little something about, but I'm dying to know more about. Uh, and maybe it's something else. So uh, 
this thus begins our journey uh, of the summer of 2019. Uh, we lifted off that slab very carefully, uh, dropped a ladder down in that hole, uh, you know, and, and this is um, generally as an archaeologist, uh, I try to move away from the stories of kind of discovery. I try to change the narrative instead of, you know, Indiana Jones sort of, uh, you know, that, that moment of, of turning up the dirt. I, I like to pitch the story through what the, the long research uh, path gives us uh, about what, how we understand evidence. But, but this is truly a moment when, when, you know, we're sort of faced with something we're, we're not expecting. Uh, and uh, so, uh, that's what we're looking into. Um, so this is looking west uh, toward the Wren building, uh, you know, through this uh, wonderful vaulted uh, brick tunnel. Uh, so um, what I'm going to do in my talk tonight is uh, talk with you in sort of three major points here. Uh, how we approach the research uh, and recording of this artifact, how we approach preserving the artifact, and how we restored the site. Uh, so immediately, uh, you know, we had the contractor stop work uh, and said, you know, we're, we are declaring that this is an archaeological site. We checked with uh, the head office to find out, uh, you know, how much time we can spend on this. And we were told that convocation was going to happen in this space on August 28th, 2019. Uh, this was June 12th. So basically we had, uh, you know, a, a, a two months and a little bit of time uh, to figure out what we were going to do. Uh, so I'll begin here uh, in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, histor historical research always encounters a number of things. So I'm, I'm going to look at the original construction here. We always look at previous archaeology and other sites. We learn about buildings in Virginia, particularly early Virginia, by comparatively through other sites. Uh, almost everyone in the historical archaeology field, architectural history and historic preservation know each other because we learn about our sites by comparing notes across space and time. And and then in Williamsburg, we have the added overlay of the Rockefeller restoration. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's one of our challenges to figure out, is, is this an 18th century construction or is this something that dates from the 1920s or 30s from the Rockefeller restoration? So uh, this is how we began that. Um, we knew there were drains under the building. So this is just a schematic to show what we're talking about is, uh, you know, there, there's uh, evidence that that on the front of the building. So this is the east front facing Colonial Williamsburg, where the banners, where the class banners hang, uh, you know, some kind of open drain under the floor there uh, to carry water into a vaulted drain uh, that then uh, goes into another vaulted drain that that angles downward toward where the sunken garden is today. Uh, so this is just schematic to give you a sense of, of the space we're in. So we're, we're under the Wren building and under the yard behind the Wren building. Um, the first reference to a drain at William and Mary is uh, before the 1705 fire. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna read this because it's interesting. Uh, Governor Francis Nicholson uh, left us this note that the drain cost above 100 pounds and is so ill contrived that there is no descent whereby the water stagnating is very offensive to the smell and corrupts wa the water in wells so that both are useless unless just after the drain has been cleaned. Uh, as with any reference uh, to work, to, to uh, activity at William and Mary before 1865, we have to ask the question about what does this mean in terms of the labor of enslaved people who worked in this space? Uh, you know, and this little snippet tells us three very important things about how this drain relates to slave labor. So first, uh, and I've, I've highlighted kind of the concepts here, uh, you know, that, that constructing the drain was expensive. I'm sure because of labor and also uh, because of materials. Uh, the, it smelled inside the building. Uh, we know from documents that workspaces and living spaces for enslaved people belonging to the college, many of them were in the cellar spaces of, of what we now call the Wren building, uh, living under the eastern part, uh, cooking and working in the kitchen. The, the, the kitchen space under the Great Hall was, was kitchen baking and brewing uh, in the first version of the college. Uh, and then also this reference to unless the drain has been cleaned. So when Francis Nicholson is writing this, 
Uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the building's not even been habitable for 10 years, uh, and already uh, it is someone's job to clean out the drain. Uh, you know, so, so we've got uh, the labor of building, the workspaces uh, in proximity to this, and then an another job uh, of someone to clean out this drain. So, um, I'm going to remind us here that this college that we are talking about is L-shaped. So uh, the, the building that is first built beginning in 1695 uh, is L-shaped until at least 1732. So the east range of the building, the main block uh, facing Colonial Williamsburg is this, and then the north wing where the Great Hall is, uh, are, is the building we're talking about. And the drain that we're talking about in the, in the western yard of this building, uh, as far as we know, the, the people running the college are still thinking about this building being a quadrangle. So when, when it was challenging to us to think about the drain in this yard space as being part of a structure that people were conceiving of that was not yet there. And I think that's important to think about. So the building we're talking about is L-shaped here. It doesn't, have the, it doesn't get the chapel uh, till, till I say when. So, um, the uh, one of the protagonists in this story is Alexander Spotswood. So we've moved from Governor Francis Nicholson to Alexander Spotswood, who's governor 1710 to 1722. Uh, and uh, Hugh Jones, who wrote a history of Virginia and seven it published in 1724, um, says that the, the, the building at the college <clears throat> Beautiful and commodious, first modeled by Sir Christopher Wren. That's that that Wren uh, that that mention of Wren that the people, uh, the the gentlemen adapting it to the country saw buildings by Wren and wanted something that looked like that. It probably does not mean that Christopher Wren drew plans for a building and mailed them to Virginia on the next ship. Um, but what I've highlighted here is since the college burned down in 1705, it has been rebuilt and nicely contrived, altered and adorned by the ingenious direction of Governor Spotswood. So Alexander Spotswood, as far as we know, is the person who re-engineers how water moves under and around the college building. Um, there is a, a couple of accounts that he raised the grade uh, in, in the east yard of the building to change the drainage, that he re-engineered the drain that ran underneath the building. And so that's the, the drain that we, we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, you know, so there, there's some more system for draining the building before the, fire, the building burns in 1705. Uh, it's not working and Governor Spotswood is the person uh, uh, who, who decides to rethink this. So we knew there was a drain associated with this building. This was not a secret. So I'm gonna show you uh, uh, five images here uh, that are the existing, uh, the, the, the places where we understand this drain to be. So this is in the center of the building. This is underneath the entry hall uh, of, of the Wren building today. Uh, and there's a little tiny door that opens to this vault uh, in the center uh, underneath the, the, the center passage of the building. Uh, and so the, the floor uh, beef, uh, in front of this door, uh, underneath there was probably some kind of open drain or some, you know, some kind of gutter that then led into this vaulted drain uh, that goes through the building. Uh, the next one is, uh, so this, all the black and white photographs uh, in this presentation, by the way, almost all of them are from the Rockefeller Restoration. Almost all the color photographs are one that, ones that I took on site. So this image uh, was taken during the, the Rockefeller Restoration. Again, that's uh, 1928 to 1931. Uh, and this is excavating along the side of the Great Hall. And this structure right here is a vaulted drain tunnel. Um, and maybe this is the drain that was stinking in 1704. Uh, this is attached to the kitchen, um, probably received, uh, you know, wastewater, uh, food scraps, possibly uh, vermin uh, from the kitchen. Uh, but that's that's where we're talking about, uh, you know. And so the, the Rockefeller restoration uncovered that, uh, put some waterproofing on it. But other than that, they didn't really say much about it. They just said they they found a vaulted drain tunnel um, and and as far as we can tell they didn't investigate it past this this cut of the earth there the, the 
college building is the building that the Rockefeller restoration architects are cutting their teeth on. So they've got a lot on their plate, just paying attention to how they're going to restore the oldest academic building in the United States uh, and one of the largest buildings in colonial Virginia. Um, on the uh, west side, again, uh, this is underneath the west steps that go up on the piazza of the Wren building today, and you see the vaulted drain tunnel coming out through the west wall of the building. Uh, they doc again, they photographed this, they looked at the configuration of the steps, uh, and as, but, but they didn't say much about it beyond that. Uh, and then in the building, uh, so the, these are underneath um, in that space, so, so this is in the Western space, uh, you know, so, so that previous photograph is taken just on the other side of, uh, I'm sorry, the other side of this wall. Uh, and you can see a 1920s drain pipe laying in this, uh, in, in the drain here. And the Rockefeller restoration rebuilt this vaulted drain in, in the basement space of the building. Uh, and this is the, the open drain underneath the floor in the front part of the building. And this is that little drain opening I showed you in a previous photograph, right? So this is what we do at William & Mary when we're faced with research questions. We say, what's the historic evidence for it? And what did they know about it during the Rockefeller restoration? Because the Rockefeller restoration significantly altered the landscape that we deal with. Uh, and so that's part of, part of how we have to understand the past here. Um, in addition to understanding the drains of the Wren building itself, then we also look to other sites. Um, and right in Williamsburg, there are vaulted drains draining, uh, you know, underneath Duke of Gloucester Street. If you walk from, from the college to the Capitol, you are going to walk over vaulted brick drain tunnels. Um, the, the photographs in the upper right here uh, show Noel Hume's excavation at Custis Square uh, in the 1960s. And, and uh, Noel had a, a humorous story of, of getting himself stuck uh, in, a, in this drain tunnel that drained uh, the, the Custis house there. Uh, and then Alexander Spotswood's own house, when, when he leaves uh, Williamsburg and retires to uh, Germana uh, in what's now Orange County, Virginia, builds a house that has a vaulted drain tunnel. So both of these, both of these drains date from uh, the 17 teens, about the same time that Spotswood is re-engineering the drainage at William and Mary. So this is not, uh, it, it's not a hugely common way to deal with water, but it's not entirely uncommon uh, and uh, you know but it's uh, the 2019 summer is a, a fabulous opportunity to learn more about this so um, 1732 the south wing of the college building which holds the chapel gets put on um, you know and, and this is the only 18th century image this image from the Bodleian plate is the only 18th century image of the rear of the college building um, it doesn't give us landscape features it doesn't show what's happening out here with this drain but uh, you know from here on out the, the 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 history part of the talk this is this is the building I'm talking about um, and again, you know, this idea that, that this formal landscape garden on the Eastern Front also involved the movement and, and sort of terracing, um, sorry about that, terracing of, of the landscape here to, to affect the drainage through the building, but then also to facilitate the, this formal aspect uh, for the, the 18th century college. So moving forward, uh, the next uh, reference we have to the drain is in 1784. So just after the American Revolution, uh, the college pays, excuse me, Humphrey Harwood to repair the drain in the garden. So uh, here's the college building, this blue U-shaped building here, and this drain shoots underneath the building uh, and out here, the sunken garden, uh, probably destroyed most of the evidence of these gardens, but the, the kitchen garden that fed the college, as well as the physic garden, the botanical gardens for scientific research for, for the classes in natural philosophy at the college, were out here to the west of the building. And there's a suggestion in this that possibly these drains from the building emptied out here to provide water for the gardens. Perhaps there were cisterns there. So we have a lot of questions about, uh, you know, where this water went uh, and, and how it was managed uh, once it was moved away from the building, uh, removing <laughs> the stinking waste from the building. Okay, 
So uh, as part of our research query, we then go through the visual record uh, of the building looking for any cues at all uh, that are going to tell us uh, anything about this drain. Uh, 19th century images uh, in this particular case offered absolutely no help. Uh, so, you know, here are three uh, kind of representational images from the 19th century. This sketch by Mary Southall, which, which indicates nothing about the landscape, right? There's, there's nothing in the yard that says there's, there's any kind of drain or in any kind of anything functional there. Uh, here's an image from the late 19th or very early 20th century of commencement, which was held on the 4th of July every year. Uh, this is in the, the yard outside uh, the Great Hall. Um, and, uh, you know, these paths don't uh, show us any kind of disturbances here. Uh, and then this sketch from 1862, which again, um, you know, this is the building as it was rebuilt uh, after between 1859 and 1862 with these two Italianate towers. Uh, and, you know, but again, nothing, nothing in this landscape to give us, to offer any evidence about the drain. Um, and then we move forward to the, the 20th century, to the period of uh, William and Mary building a new campus to house uh, it, it's the, what, what becomes, you know, a, a co-educational progressive liberal arts institution uh, that admitted women in 1918 and uh, from 1922 to 1935, William and Mary enters into a significant campaign of improving campus uh, by adding what we now call the sunken garden precinct. And you can see in this aerial photograph from 1928, these buildings going up, um, the sunken garden is not yet excavated um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, but, but we will talk about uh, the improvements, the utilities uh, that disrupt the ground here uh, to provide uh, the mechanical services to all of these spaces. Um, you know, and, and this is all to just a, you know, a fabulous opportunity, a talk like this, uh, to look through these historic photographs. Um, Pre-restoration, uh, the back of the Wren building, uh, you may recall, or the back of it was still called the college building then. Uh, the piazza was entirely bricked in. There was a staircase in that passage space. Uh, there, was no, there were no exits on the end of the Great Hall or of the chapel. Uh, you know, they quipped, the, the, the restoration architects quipped that the ivy was the only thing holding up the building in some places. Uh, you know, and then a photograph here uh, of the Rockefeller restoration. Uh, and, you know, I was particularly interested in seeing, you know, did they open the drain that's right in this location during any, any of these periods? Uh, because I, I needed to understand uh, how this drain uh, functioned in, in various times, uh, how, how it was treated in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, you know, and, and the, the, these photographs offer absolutely no clues uh, about this. And the, the restoration records don't mention anything beyond those the photographs I showed you of the drain coming out of the building adjacent to, to the walls. So um, another clue here uh, is that the, uh, the, the concrete slab that we were taking up uh, with and replacing uh, went down in 1931, sometime between when this picture was taken in spring of 1931 and when this photograph was taken in November of 1931. So that, uh, you know, so we have a hard date, uh, the, the, that drain that we uncovered, that hole we opened, uh, no one has looked into it since 1931 at least. Uh, so. All right, so uh, then we go to new archaeology. Um, on June 12th, when uh, this feature came, uh, came calling, uh, it seemed like every archaeologist uh, in, uh, in the, the, the region um, had just signed all of their contracts and lined up their summer staff uh, as well as all their summer work projects. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we kind of have a call list uh, for, for how we move uh, through archaeology. Uh, Wemcar is right across the street. Colonial Williamsburg is right across the street. And everybody said, uh, you know, I have just a few minutes, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, my staff is entirely booked for the rest of the summer. 
Um, so, uh, you know, our first approach to this is to bring in uh, archaeologists to, to sort of do triage, to diagnose the site, to say, what do we need to do here, both to document it and to make sure we are protecting the artifact and to make sure uh, we, we can move, move forward here safely for both, for both people and for the, the historical record. Uh, so we needed archaeologists to begin this conversation. So uh, it turned out once we got the concrete slab off here that we had three places that we needed to investigate. So the first one uh, is we're calling the access well to the drain tunnel and, and that's right here in the Ren yard. Uh, the second one, there was a, a place in the yard where uh, in the last five years that I've been at Historic Campus, every few months I call uh, facilities management, I call our grounds crew and I say, uh, you know, that place that's sinking in the yard needs to be filled in again before someone trips there. So we knew there was some kind of problem back here. Uh, and I suspected when, when we found this, I thought, okay, uh, you know, did this drain tunnel collapse back here and what are we going to find? Uh, and so this is the second place that we needed to investigate. And then there was a very small subsidence here just just west of the steps of the building uh, that we were afraid that maybe the tunnel had collapsed. That was not the case. So, th so this, this one in, in the foreground becomes completely negligible and the ones I'll be talking about are the, this access well uh, and then this one that we'll call the 1924 sewer line. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, you know, th th this in plan is what we're looking at. Uh, the red lines I put on here to approximate where these drains run uh, through the building, directly through the center of the building, draining the eastern yard through the building and, and to the west. Uh, the first access point is here in, the, in this courtyard that again, you know, I will remind you, this is an L-shaped building then, but they are still thinking about it as being a quadrangle, uh, you know, and I kept reminding us to kind of ask that question of, of, you know, how does this, uh, how, how should we think about this if this building was to be completely enclosed? Um, the kitchen drain, uh, that, that drain you saw coming off the wall of the Great Hall here, ties to this. This is something that I did not know that these two drains in the building uh, connected. Uh, so that was really exciting. I'll show you photographs in just a minute. Uh, and then this other black box is, is uh, where the, the sewer line intersected uh, the, the 18th century drain. Okay, so our first job uh, is uh, when Carl William and Mary Center for Archaeological Research uh, was able to come over and, and do a couple days of, of quick diagnosis and documentation. Uh, let's, let's remove the extra soil from this feature. Let's figure out how stable it is. Let's figure out, is it 18th century uh, to the bottom uh, and to the top? Uh, has it been cut into before? Uh, you know, how can we understand it? So uh, they cleared away uh, all the extra soil here, uh, opened up the, the, uh, the berm a little bit on the sides to see if there was a builder's trench that showed how this uh, was in fact constructed. Uh, and uh, it's kind of exciting. Uh, you know, so in this, uh, there's, there's the 18th century floor of this drain tunnel, the walls of the drain tunnel. And then what we're looking at here is, so here's the arch of the tunnel. You can see it in the sides here. And then the box, uh, this access box was put in at some later date. Uh, it chopped into the top of the tunnel uh, for some reason. Uh, and uh, that there's still a big question mark exactly why. Um, and so here's a schematic showing uh, the, the stratigraphy of this. So at the very bottom, this 18th century brick floor, uh, there's a, an inch or so of, of kind of an 18th century soil wash across the bottom. Uh, a deposit inside the tunnel of 18th and 19th century uh, domestic related uh, college related goods. Uh, there are things relating to foodways, uh, their wine bottle, uh, you know, drinking and dining, uh, a, a few other things. Uh, there was a piece of uh, lead window came. Uh, so that's for, for leaded glass windows. There were leaded windows on the building before the, the 1705 fire. Uh, you know, so, so kind of that the, the, the fullness of the 18th and the 19th century is suggested in that deposit that was in there. 
Um, and then bricks from the tunnel arch were on top of that, uh, and some soil deposits on top of that, which suggested that per perhaps this opening was open at different times uh, over the course of history. Um, there's no evidence here that this was open in some way that, that it had some kind of grate on top and was open to the elements. It doesn't have a record of the 17-5 fire, of the 1859 fire, of the 1862 fire. It doesn't have records of building materials from rebuilding the building each of those times. So it, you know, it appears that, that there are discrete moments when this is opened, things fall into it, uh, and then it's closed again. Uh, so uh, you know, that, th there's still some questions about exactly the chronology here. Uh, but um, in addition to uh, the sort of the structural record uh, and, and the, the record of deposits within that, uh, in the 1950s, uh, someone named JP crawled into this tunnel uh, in 1959. So JP 59, there's a number of uh, uh, samples of graffiti uh, from the 1950s uh, in the, on the wall of this, this tunnel. Uh, and uh, 1958, there was a story in the flat hat saying that students found uh, an old tunnel uh, and uh, were crawling into these tunnels that they got through through the, uh, the Wren building kitchen. Uh, and uh, so this seems to, to match to that, uh, although the, uh, the flat hat does not mention anybody by name that we can match to these initials. So uh, any of you alumni watching, uh, if you happen to know JP for class of 59, uh, you know, tell him he dropped his driver's license in the tunnel or something to, to get him to contact us. Um, so uh, looking, I, I showed you a, a photo a few minutes ago of from down in that access point, looking back toward the Wren building. Uh, this photo is taken in that access point again, looking west. So looking west, we can see the junction of the kitchen tunnel uh, entering this main tunnel right here. Uh, and while we had these open this summer, uh, we had people in this access point, uh, in that access point, once we cleaned out the fill that was there and in, and in the kitchen, uh, and we could talk to each other through these drain tunnels. Um, we did not have a confined space permit to to go through these tunnels. Uh, we could photograph it uh, in, as, as best we could from the openings, but, but we did not go spelunking here. Um, that will wait for another time. Uh, and while we're on this image, I will point out that there is a 1920 ceramic sewer pipe laid into this tunnel. So we have this, this moment in the 1920s when, when this uh, 18th century structure is being used as a conduit for a 1920s uh, utility line. So um, then moving further west in the Wren Yard uh, to the place where the, the yard had been sinking over the years, um, here's that hole right there once we got the concrete slab off it. And here it is cleaned up and made to look like an archeological site. And here, you know, this is fabulous because we can see the top of this vaulted drain tunnel, you know, heading right back underneath the building. Uh, you know, so this is June and August uh, of 2019 uh, and, uh, you know, moving to this other part of the site now. So uh, again, uh, you know, our job as archeologists and now, now we've hired uh, James River Institute for Archeology. span um, In the meantime, we had called uh, preservation architects, uh, Mesick Cohen Wilson Baker uh, to come in and advise us on preservation. Uh, they reached out to James River Institute for Archaeology, uh, who then came in to, to pick up where WEMCAR uh, could not continue. So uh, in this western part, uh, the subsidence, in fact, uh, that we had out here, this sinking place, was because the, this, the drain line had been chopped through in 1924. Uh, and here again, from the flat hat, October 3rd, 1924, ancient underground passage discovered. And it talks about uh, construction crews the summer before uh, digging a line, a sewer line, a uh, trench for a sewer line between south of Jamestown Road to Monroe Hall, which is uh, on Richmond Road, uh, and chopping through this, what they said is an ancient underground tunnel. Uh, and, and that's kind of the extent of the, the documentation from 1924. Uh, but there, that terracotta line that we saw uh, further up uh, then, you know, connects to the line that's, that's under Allison's 
uh, feet here. So uh, this is the next place where we where, that we need to understand. Um, it looks like the trench for the 1924 sewer line is about eight feet deep. Uh, and when, when they hit this vaulted tunnel, they just smashed their way through it. And so you can see the brick floor here. You can see the sides and, and the vault of the tunnel. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so then how do we preserve an artifact like this? Uh, what is our role if we know that we are going to be returning the site, uh, re restoring the site in some way? Uh, you know, our job is to preserve the artifact, document it uh, in every single way we can, uh, and then evaluate the safety of both the artifact and the people who use this space. Uh, you know, the spaces around William and Mary's Wren building are very important for our campus rituals, uh, for many of our ceremonial events. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, making sure that both the artifact and, and people are, are protected here uh, is part of this. So uh, Music Cohen Wilson Baker uh, is a preservation architecture firm. Uh, they've done work for William and Mary before. They helped us with the ADA ramp on the south side of Wren uh, and a number of other projects. They've worked at, uh, I, I, I worked with them many years ago at Monticello. They've done work at University of Virginia at Mount Vernon, lots of other important places. Uh, they brought in spring structural engineers to evaluate the brick structure. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about here for just, uh, just a moment. Um, so um, so uh, we documented this in both uh, the largest way we could uh, and in the smallest ways that we could. Uh, you know, so uh, this is a laser scanning project, um, Brianna Baker from uh, Music Cohen Wilson Baker. Uh, at every point that we could drop a laser scanner into this. So we have uh, at this point, two points of access in the Ren Yard. Uh, we have the space underneath the building uh, where we can get to it. Uh, and then it turns out there's another space uh, closer to the sunken garden where we could get another reading on it. Uh, and so across the center here, uh, you can see this laser scan uh, that gives us a read of this, you know, English bond construction, uh, you know, of this structure. And here's the access well. Here's the kitchen tunnel coming in from the, the north side. Here's the, the 1924 sewer line cut through this. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so documenting this in every way we possibly can document it. Um, in addition to that, we took mortar samples at every access point, uh, and we are hoping, particularly in this place where we have the access well, that the mortar samples are going to help us sort out the chronology, uh, possibly the date uh, of, a, you know, when this access point was put in, why it was put in, uh, and, uh, you know, what, what, what role that had exactly. Um, Additionally, mortar samples also often uh, can uh, hold pollen uh, and give us microbotanical uh, signatures that, that help us understand the environment in which this, this structure was built. Um, we also uh, had the, the uh, great good graces of uh, Kirsten Moffat, who's a conservator and materials analyst at Colonial Williamsburg, who came and took XRF readings, X-ray fluorescence readings uh, on the bricks. Uh, and so this is part of a sample of, um, you know, by themselves, the, 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 the XRF readings don't necessarily tell us a lot, but comparatively, uh, we're building a sample of, of bricks from different sources. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's the sort of measurement that becomes part of larger data sets uh, that, that may reveal things down the road. Uh, and, uh, you know, so here uh, she's, she's uh, using this uh, portable XRF gun uh, to take uh, chemical readings uh, on the brick surfaces. So, um, and then for scale here, this is Andy Edwards, who works for James River Institute of Archaeology, uh, William and Mary class of, I believe, 71. I meant to check that. Uh, you know, and for our scale figure, he is standing uh, at, the, at a level that's the base of this, uh, the drain tunnel. Um, he's a, a standard size human being, uh, you know, and, and so this is a massive structure uh, that was, uh, you know, right, right underneath our feet. Uh, and in this image, you can see that the early, when, when we first excavated this, uh, the, the soil line was about here, but then because of the structural engineering to put a cover on this when closing it up, uh, we 
we needed to expose another foot and a half on each side to carry uh, the, the cover that I'll talk about in a minute. So that gave us even more of an opportunity to understand uh, the, the drain tunnel. Um, significantly, there's almost no artifacts in the drain tunnel down here. Uh, so, so the contents of the tunnel itself down here uh, compare not at all to the 18th and 19th century materials that were in the other access point. Um, we also took microbotanical samples uh, here and on the other side of the kitchen drain with this question of, you know, can we get some sort of uh, intriguing uh, readings about what's going on uh, at different places in the college building uh, from those uh, from those those soil chemistry analysis. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of difference. Um, so it seems that draining water was the main function here, that it really wasn't serving as a conduit for, for sort of major, uh, you know, cultural signatures. Um, measurements uh, to get the scale of this thing. So the interior of this tunnel uh, from the bottom to the top of the arch is about 41 inches, two feet wide. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, that, that reference to someone cleaning out the drains. Uh, it, it's absolutely clear that someone could crawl through this tunnel uh, without too much discomfort uh, to, to clean it out, uh, to put in that 1924 sewer pipe. Uh, you know, this is, this is a pretty massive structure. Uh, the exterior, it's, it's 55 inches high. And uh, just based on what's still extant from it, it was probably at least 200 feet long. Um, the sunken garden, which is uh, excavated in 1935, excuse me, uh, destroyed whatever evidence was on the western end of this tunnel. So, um, and then I'll talk a little bit here about, about restoring the site. Uh, so, um, the access well, it was decided that to preserve this, that uh, we needed to stabilize the brick box at the surface uh, to carry a steel cover. So uh, this is historic brick, brick mason Cheetah Waller uh, and his crew who are laying a couple courses of brick to create a level surface uh, that's going to carry this steel plate uh, that is then going to distribute the load of the walk on top of it. Uh, the structural engineers recommended that, that the vaulted tunnel was in pretty good shape. Um, we wanted to reduce any risk of direct loads on it. So for instance, no more trucks uh, in the yard uh, here. Um, but th this one was solved with, with masonry and steel. The other location, uh, we needed to distribute the weight away from the, the edges of that vault. Uh, and so uh, the, the structural engineers uh, worked with custom welding to design this stainless steel structure that was, uh, you know, made to the exact measurements of the drain. Uh, and so that was lowered in here. Uh, as I said, we, we cut back the, the soil here uh, by another foot and a half. Uh, so this, uh, the, the weight of this steel structure is sitting at ground, on, on solid ground uh, below the, the footing of the, the drain uh, and uh, carrying the weight then of the fill that goes in here uh, and then uh, uh, new concrete slab on top. Um, you know, and everyone on site that day, of course, signed the inside of this, this tunnel. Um, one of the other things that we did uh, was when we re-poured the concrete slab, we put in brake joints at every eight feet. So if we wanted to go back and do research on part of this drain tunnel again, we would not have to dig up the entire Wren courtyard to do it. Uh, you know, the 1931 slab was poured in one very long pour. Uh, and we decided that, you know, that, that if we strategically put in joints, we could open it at certain places to do research. So we thought about, uh, you know, the potential for research uh, in, in, at some future time. Um, one of the stories that comes out of our research on this drain tunnel uh, that, you know, is kind of an unexpected side note here in discussing the 18th century uh, and then the restoration of, of William and Mary with Rockefeller's money, uh, you know, is a little glimpse into labor practices from the 1920s. Um, so this, this inset map, uh, you know, this is the, one of those grand romantic plans for, for what William and Mary's Colonial Revival Campus is going to look like. Uh, and that red line is showing uh, roughly where, where a, the sewer line runs from south of Jamestown Road across the center of campus. 
campus to Monroe Hall, uh, you know, and that's the sewer line we encountered. But, uh, you know, then in thinking about this, so, uh, you know, this is a standard uh, five foot rake handle here, um, but this dark cut in the soil is a hand excavated trench eight feet deep to carry a terracotta sewer line uh, in the bottom. Uh, you know, so this is hand excavated, um, you know, and, and most of the labor crew, uh, we don't have photographs of this particular work, um, but, you know, these are probably African American men who are excavating trenches trenches like this by hand in the 1920s. Uh, you know, so someday if someone's ever going to do a, a dissertation or a study of 1920s labor, uh, you know, we've got some physical evidence of, uh, you know, <laughs> conditions that certainly wouldn't pass OSHA regulations today. Uh, you know, OSHA regulations now say, you know, we get we get three feet down and, and we've got to cut back our walls and put in, in bracing materials and, and so forth. Uh, you know, so this is, this is a little daunting to think about excavating a trench like that. Uh, and then um, we come back to this question about uh, ex building this to begin with. Um, so this is, uh, these two photographs are taken from uh, th this point where the sewer line cuts through the, the drain. Uh, so we're about 66 feet from the west wall of the Wren building. Uh, and then on the, the right, uh, looking west toward the sunken garden in the distance there, uh, you know, and, and this is about 200 feet of this structure. So, uh, you know, the, the dimensions of the trench, just to put this tunnel in, uh, meant that enslaved men and, and possibly women uh, who were considered labor in the, in the, the, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, the enslaved men and women who excavated this trench uh, displaced about 7,000 cubic feet of clay, uh, which is about 500 tons. Uh, and uh, 18th century estimates uh, calculate that a single laborer could move uh, what, what they called four demi cords, four cubic feet of earth uh, each day. So about 16 cubic feet of earth. So this, this represents about 438 days of work by 18th century labor standards. So, uh, you know, in a, if you wanted to excavate the trench to install this drain in a month, you would need a work crew of about 14 people uh, who could move a lot of dirt. Uh, and, and that has nothing to do then with, with making the brick, uh, firing the brick, laying the brick, all of that. Um, when, uh, when this uh, drain is being, uh, being built, being constructed, uh, there is a brick kiln on, on, on the site of where the Wren Chapel is today. Uh, so quite possibly the bricks for this drain tunnel were being made right here uh, on site uh, and then, uh, you know, brought over and, and put here. Uh, I doubt that the people, you know, uh, there, it, it would be hard to conceive that they excavated the trench and used any of that clay. So where the, where this clay went, uh, you know, is is uh, is anybody's guess. Uh, you know, maybe for garden terraces, but uh, you know, the labor of this is significant. It, it's a it's a major engineering feat, uh, and uh, you know, it's 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 quite a marvelous thing to see. Um, so. Uh, Here's a list. Uh, Archaeology is always a team sport. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this, uh, I, I think there are 30 people listed uh, right on this slide in front of you. And that, that's not even including, uh, you know, a number of other people uh, working for the, the, the firms who were involved, um, you know, multiple archaeologists. Uh, uh, you know, in, engineers, architects, uh, technicians uh, to do welding, to, to lay brick, to do uh, historic brickwork as well as modern work, uh, and then, uh, you know, colleagues at William & Mary, Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Uh, and I will end with, uh, you know, a, a slide of, of the, but these are the reports that, that uh, the work in 2019 generated, uh, as well as some of the historic sources that I used to put this together. Um, and I have time to take your questions. Let me just say before, uh, before we take questions, if you have one, please type it into the chat or into the Q&A function here on our webinar, our Zoom webinar. Uh, but I'm going to take the liberty as the moderator, Susan, to ask the first question. Uh, we Please all know do. that the engineered transportation and movement of water and liquids and waste dates back to the Roman Empire and even beyond. And we know that great, great buildings like St. Peter's 
were begun in the early 16th century and completed in the early 17th century, clearly major building projects. Uh, but of course, America was in many respects a uh, wilderness without uh, the sort of constructions of Western civilizations prior to the arrival of people from Europe. And although I'm an architectural historian, to me, I always have a difficult time getting to that transformation point between a uh, non-Western constructed society to a Western constructed society in North America. And to me, thinking about drains that might have been constructed in the early 1700s, um, you know, that, that's sort of surprising to me, especially in a small town like Williamsburg. You might imagine uh, maybe a little bit more uh, believably it happening in larger cities up in the Northeast. So is this the kind of thing that would be typical in a colonial town uh, in, a, so, in North America, or is this something that's really out of the ordinary? Well, you know, Williamsburg, when Williamsburg is laid out, it, it's very aspirational. Francis Nicholson lays out uh, a very formal town uh, and knows that, you know, that we, you know, the town of William, the city of Williamsburg on the eve of the American Revolution is the capital of Great Britain's largest, uh, most populous, and one of its wealthiest North American colonies, right? So what seems to us like a small town today actually had a really significant economic and political place in the 18th century. And, and that can be a little hard to get our heads around, right? The capital of Virginia had moved from Jamestown. It's one of the things that makes Williamsburg. Uh, and then it moves to Richmond in 1781, uh, thanks to William & Mary alumni, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and, um, you know, but, but in fact, when, when Francis Nicholson designs the city of Williamsburg, he lays out a very formal town. And ne negotiating, you know, the, the water, uh, you know, it's on the high point of a peninsula. They fill in ravines to make, uh, you know, a straight street a mile long and 90 feet wide. Uh, they, there are drains underneath Duke of Gloucester Street, as I said. Um, so they are thinking of this as, as quite an aspirational place. Um, I've, you know, I, I go back and forth on, you know, William and Mary, the, the college building at William and Mary, I, I think for a time is probably the largest building in North America. And, um, you know, it, it's the largest college building during the colonial period. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so they are pouring the aspirations of more than just Virginia into this building. There are, you know, lots of English investors who are saying, you know, we want to build this new place and it's going to be important and we're going to make it look important. You know, it, it's a big public, public works project and it's meant to impress. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, they are thinking about, you know, what, what does a, um, a proper town need to look like? And, it, and it's the same thing that Thomas Jefferson is thinking about in 1785 in, in Notes on Virginia, where he says that there's no good architecture in Virginia. You know, he calls the, the college building, uh, you know, a brick kiln and, you know, says that, that the, the classical orders on the, on the, the capital are, are, are are only tolerably just uh, because he recognizes that the, the formal aspect of a proper capital city needs to have, uh, you know, th those kind of recognizable um, marks of, of its culture. Um, so you're absolutely right, David, but I, you know, I think the scale of understanding both, both the aspirations of what this capital is going to be and, and the men who are behind, uh, you know, harnessing all this labor and all these materials, you know, the way they're thinking of this real, really is, is well beyond, you know, kind of, you know, the stinking drains that they're complaining about in 17 for. Great, got it. And I think what, reading between the lines of what you're saying, I think you're saying that maybe uh, Williamsburg was at the upper level of how towns were being constructed at that moment in time, and there might be other settlements that wouldn't see this kind of underground activity yeah. for some decades, maybe even a century. 
Um, sure. You know, I mean, the, you know, the waterworks at Philadelphia are a great example, right, of the city rethinking how it needs to manage to, to be a growing and thriving city. Uh, you know, the, yes, this is, this is part of what um, municipal works do. Great. Well, we do have a couple of questions that co have come in through the Q&A, and so I'll just pose them to you one at a time. Uh, Jim asks, if there, were no, if there was no sunken garden, did the drainage channel end in a well in the kitchen gardens? Um, that's a great question, one I would love to know the answer to. Um, it's, you know, it's entirely possible that there's some kind of cistern there to collect that water. It's possible that it's some kind of open drain, uh, you know, that the, the water just you know, seeps out of it, uh, but we, we don't know. Um, but, you know, the fact that we have, you know, the, the drain in the garden being repaired suggests that, that it has some function in the garden. Got it. So Bert Baskerville asks, did the ceramic pipe laid in the tunnel during the Rockefeller re restoration serve as a waste drain and were the locations of those pipes documented when they were laid? <laughs> um, so actually the, 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 um, the ceramic pipe goes in in 24. So that's actually the, before the Rockefeller restoration, that's the oh. 22 to 35 campus. Um, yeah, all these layers here. Um, and the Rockefeller re restoration appears to take those out. So if you recall that, that photograph I showed of the drain tunnels underneath the building, that ceramic drain pipe is, is all broken up. So the, uh, it seems that they are relaying, re re rearranging the, the utilities at that point. Um, the Rockefeller restoration actually said very little, the records say very little about the 20th century or the 19th century before them. They were interested in the 18th century. And so when you go to their records, um, they don't talk about what they did with 19th century artifacts in the building. So even things like, like plaques that were on the building that, that are shown in photographs on the building before the Rockefeller restoration and get put back, the records don't say anything about them because they're, what they want to do is talk about the 18th century. So it, it's this, you know, this case where the 19th century at William & Mary is almost invisible. Got it. Are there any other questions that, that our audience wants to put forward tonight? We have one that just came in from David Luce. Uh, in the 1920s Flat Hat article, I thought I saw mention of the tunnel extending to Lake Matoka. Was that just speculation by the student reporter? Pretty sure that was just speculation. Um, you know, that they, it also had a number of other kind of, um, th there is an age of, uh, in fact, we, we've seen it at, at Germana, the, the early um, uh, 20th century encounters with Governor Spotswood's house in, in what's now Orange County, where, uh, you know, they saw this drain tunnel and they said that must have been for escaping from Indian attacks or uh, that's where slaves escaped. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so that those two stories were also present in the 1920s Flat Hat article. Um, I've, I've wondered though, there, there are water lines, you know, kind of the, um, the fingers of the body of water that's Crimdell that came up into roughly where the sunken, almost to where Washington Hall is today. And I'm wondering if that's what they meant by uh, Lake Matoka. Um, there, there's no evidence, there's, there's nothing to explain why they suggested Lake Matoka. Okay, that makes sense. Well, Susan, I want to thank you for a fascinating discussion tonight and for joining us. Uh, I want to thank the audience for joining in tonight, and I hope to see all of you at one of our next lectures or programs. Everybody have a great evening and see you next time. Thank you. Good night.